is Dave Grossman? It's a name that most people have never heard. However, Grossman is a pivotal figure in modern American society. His ideas have woven their way into the fabric of the military, law enforcement, and even modern pop culture. But this influence is not benign. Grossman's teachings have resulted in death, abuses of power, and a country at odds with its own protectors. Because if the militarization and escalatory violence endemic to the culture of modern American police could ever be blamed on a single man, that man would be Dave Grossman. Grossman is an author, a former professor of psychology and military science at West Point, and a former army ranger. He's had a hand in training numerous army officers and is likely best known for his 1996 book On Killing. However, the most notable aspect of Grossman's career is his organization, the Killology Research Group, which never performed any research. And he recently renamed the organization to Grossman on Truth, for obvious public relations reasons. Although I don't know of any official statistics, Grossman has likely been responsible for training more law enforcement officers than anyone else in the country, if not the world. But even when he's not personally teaching, his work and theories still dominate the field of officer training. Caliber Press, one of the largest resources for officer training in the country, has partnered with Grossman to produce curriculum. Another training company, Sheepdog Response, is literally named after one of Grossman's theories. His work is even required reading at military and FBI academies, as well as numerous police academies throughout the country. You've probably heard Grossman's work without even realizing it. There are three types of people in this world. Sheep, wolves, and sheepdogs. And we're not raising any sheep in this family. And I will whoop your ass if you turn into a wolf. Right. Yep, that's straight out of Grossman's book. Now, there are those in the law enforcement training community who disagree with Grossman, but much of the field simply takes his theories for granted to the point where they don't even think about it anymore. It's no exaggeration to say that his work forms the foundation of the entire field. And let's just say that field now has some stair-step cracks, if you know what I'm saying. So if Grossman's work dominates large swaths of military and law enforcement training to the point where it's even seeped into pop culture, how bad could it be? Turns out, surprisingly bad. Grossman is a pseudoscientist who has used shaky research to advocate for sweeping conclusions that have effectively poisoned the well of law enforcement training. His rampant spreading of disinformation has unintentionally made him a malignant force for evil, and it's almost difficult for anyone other than a head of state to have more blood on their hands. First off, let's understand the core of Grossman's work. His main thesis is that human beings have an innate reluctance to kill each other. Sure, there are sociopaths out there, but they're a rare exception. By and large, humans find it very difficult to kill another human, which means that soldiers and law enforcement, people whose job it is to potentially kill people, need to be strongly conditioned to do so. And that without making killing a conditioned, automatic response, these people won't be able to do their jobs. Really, Grossman's main thesis is two statements. A normal human will resist using lethal force, even if that force is necessary, and being conditioned to kill as an automatic response is necessary for those in violent professions to do their jobs. Unfortunately for Grossman, both of these statements are likely dead wrong and are at the very least unsupported. His main justification for the first statement is based on the work performed by SLA Marshall, who I'm going to refer to as SLAM because I cannot pass up the opportunity to use initials that awesome. I hope he thanked his parents every day of his life. Anyway, SLAM was a military officer and journalist during the Second World War who specialized in interviewing soldiers about their experiences. In his best known work, Men Against Fire, he reported that only a small minority of soldiers, less than 25%, actually fired their weapon in combat. SLAM posits that this is because civilian norms against killing were too strong for many of the men to overcome. Now, this is important because Slam's work is the bedrock of Grossman's statement that human beings resist killing. The argument goes that soldiers in World War II trained to shoot using bullseye targets, which don't look anything like people. So when they then had to aim their guns at actual human beings, they were suddenly very resistant to fire because they'd never been conditioned to kill people. Consequently, at Slam's suggestion, the army switched to human silhouette targets, which supposedly contributed to a greatly improved rate of fire in subsequent wars. Also note, when I say rate of fire in this section, I mean the rate of soldiers that fired, not rounds per minute. That's a neat little argument, but it's probably wrong. First of all, 
Grossman takes for granted that Slam's data is accurate, which it almost definitely isn't. Slam wasn't a researcher. He was a military officer and journalist who was attempting to capture the subjective experiences of soldiers in combat. He didn't give them questionnaires asking how often they fired their weapon. He sat down with them in informal groups and asked open-ended questions. The only way for Slam to find out whether a soldier fired their weapon is if that soldier simply said so unprompted. This method of interviewing is great for understanding a subjective experience, but it's terrible for data collection. It introduces all sorts of biases that make it virtually impossible to get accurate numbers. For example, if there is a cultural bias against killing, as Slam posits, wouldn't that affect whether soldiers would admit to doing it? It's also reported that Slam didn't interview casualties, creating an obvious survivorship bias throughout his work. Combine this with the fact that Slam was known to take relatively few notes, preferring instead to keep much of the information in his head, which once again, is terrible when attempting to deal with statistics. We actually have many of Slam's notebooks, and none of them contain any data about firing rates. As far as anyone can tell, the 25% figure was essentially made up. Slam likely estimated a rough figure that fit his memory of the interviews in order to add some extra weight to his arguments. This is not a recent discovery either. The most famous debunking of the 25% figure was performed by Professor Roger J. Spiller in his 1988 article, SLA Marshall and the Ratio of Fire. That was eight years before Grossman's book on killing. Grossman's primary source had been thoroughly debunked years before he even started researching his book. And Grossman's response to this criticism essentially boils down to, but why would he lie? You're just trying to protect the reputation of soldiers, and Slam's unqualified pacifist grandson believes the statistics, so you should too. Honestly, Grossman would have sounded smarter if he just hadn't responded at all. To the best of my knowledge, we have no hard evidence on the actual firing rates of World War II soldiers. Now, despite this, there is actually some evidence that the firing rates of soldiers have historically been low, and that they've been much higher in more recent conflicts. However, the reasons for this are far more complex and less well understood than either Slam or Grossman lets on. Despite Slam concluding that soldiers carry with them a cultural bias against killing, even he found that the reasons men didn't fire at the enemy were multifaceted. He notes that the training didn't prepare soldiers for being shot at, that morale can greatly affect whether a soldier fights, and that inexperience could lead to soldiers simply failing to know when and where to shoot. One of the most significant factors noted in Slam's work is that basic training at the time put undue emphasis on conserving ammunition and only firing at clear targets. However, the reality of combat is often quite different, as enemy soldiers don't often present themselves like ranged targets. This meant that inexperienced soldiers were hesitant to fire partly because they were told to be hesitant to fire. In his book, Slam even notes that a soldier's belief in the effectiveness of their weapon was correlated with their willingness to use it, because it's about morale. When they were given a weapon that they perceived as being more devastating, they were more likely to use the weapon. Men who had flunked it badly with a rifle responded heroically when given a flamethrower or bar. The majority of men who were present and armed but would not fight were riflemen. In fact, Slam notes that virtually every weapon had a higher firing rate than the rifle, likely because standard issue rifles represented the least devastating weapon on the battlefield. But as interesting as this observation is, it actually undermines the idea that the soldiers were resistant to killing making it a contradiction within Slam's own work. After all, someone afraid to kill would be less likely to use an even deadlier weapon, not more likely. Even though many of these other weapons had a similar effective range, or much more gruesome to use, such as flamethrowers. But this observation does help explain why rates of fire rose in subsequent wars. By the time US troops were in Vietnam, they all had fully automatic weapons, as well as plentiful grenade launchers and RPGs, weapons that were comparatively uncommon during World War II. Even Slam's own completely unscientific findings do not support the conclusion that soldiers were resistant to fire simply because of cultural norms. But Grossman manages to turn this leap in logic into a long-haul flight by concluding that it's not cultural norms that stop soldiers from killing, but actually an intrinsic part of human nature, which he is referred to as a kind of midbrain resistance. And that's a way bigger claim. 
because that would mean that all people in all nations throughout history were resistant to the killing. I know he based this conclusion on Slam's World War II findings, but it would be really interesting if we could find some counter evidence, maybe something else happening during the war where people took part in killing mass numbers of human beings without regret or hesitation, some sort of evidence that even perfectly normal people could become monsters if given the opportunity. But I just can't think of anything. Oh wait, I know! When people point out to Grossman that his work is built on a foundation of garbage, he attempts to point towards other sources throughout history that seemingly confirm his theory. Unfortunately, Grossman often oversimplifies and misrepresents events just enough to make them fit into his personal worldview. For example, he uses the comparatively higher firing rates of British soldiers over the Argentinians in the Falklands War to assert that this is because the British were using silhouette targets and had superior conditioning to killing. However, he neglects to mention that the Argentine soldiers were conscripts with very low morale and the British soldiers were simply better trained and supported professionals whose navy already had the battle space somewhat surrounded. Not exactly an apples to apples comparison. Grossman also brings up the large number of Civil War rifles recovered at Gettysburg that were found loaded with multiple rounds, using this as evidence that soldiers were loading their weapons for each volley but were intentionally not firing. In reality, rifles like the Springfield 1861 were difficult and complicated to reload, as well as being unreliable in damp or muddy conditions. And conditions at Gettysburg eventually became so wet and muddy that many of the wounded drowned when the creek flooded. In addition, the soldiers at the time did not have the same quality of training that soldiers enjoy today, and the volley fire common at the time meant that the sound and smoke from your rifle was obscured by everyone else's. It's more likely that the guns were either loaded improperly or simply misfired, and the exhausted, terrified soldiers, either suffering from heat stroke or soaked to the bone, simply loaded the next round without noticing that their gun hadn't actually recoiled. And the number was further inflated by the fact that functioning weapons were more likely to be carried away, while any soldier with a jammed weapon would eventually discard it and pick up a different one, meaning that the jammed weapons were disproportionately abandoned on the field to be found by future researchers. It could also be the case that soldiers with weapon malfunctions would pick up a new weapon and load it before realizing that that weapon was only on the ground because someone else discarded it for malfunctioning, thus creating a scenario where no one made any mistakes Yet a gun is still double loaded. And even dropping a previously functioning firearm on the wet muddy ground could cause it to become inoperable by the time someone else picks it up. There are a multitude of plausible explanations for the loaded guns at Gettysburg, but Grossman simply dismisses any that don't precisely conform to his theory. Grossman also mentions the fact that the number of Civil War soldiers killed per minute was lower than the potential accuracy of their weapons. Unsurprisingly, he claims that this is because of their refusal to kill, except that during the Civil War, soldiers spent most of their training time on maneuvers and very little time training marksmanship. The problem of soldiers misusing their sights and accidentally shooting well over their enemies' heads, and just being generally inaccurate, was even a known issue at the time. The average Civil War soldier was great at maneuver, but likely wasn't any more accurate than a random person pulled off the street and thrown into a war. And if you can remember back to your first few times on the range, you can probably understand how being a conscript with a 160-year-old gun on an actual battlefield would make you incapable of hitting a literal barn. One of Grossman's strongest skills is using his cursory historical knowledge combined with a complete lack of context as a weapon to further his own ends. He paves over the multivariable nuance of history in order to assert his baseless claim that it's all because of a nebulous aversion to killing. But even some of Grossman's own work fails to support his theory. All of the ancient military historians report that the vast majority of killing happened in pursuit when one side was fleeing. That doesn't sound like they had much of resistance to killing. Grossman argues that the advancing armies were able to kill their fleeing opponents because they could no longer see their enemy's face. However, it seems pretty unlikely that a soldier would be able to hack a man to pieces as soon as he looks away, yet balk at pressing a button at a vaguely human shape 200 yards away through smoke and debris. If we stop to think, 
for a single second, we realize it's more likely that a fleeing, disorganized enemy with his back turned is just functionally easier to kill. Grossman also states that conditioning people to kill humans or human-shaped targets makes killing a more automatic response. He even uses the Japanese as an example for how to do it. The Japanese were masters at using classical conditioning with their soldiers. They learned to associate committing violent acts with pleasure. So let's see how well that theory agrees with Grossman's own source. In the Pacific campaigns, our forces were impressed time after time by the phenomenon of enemy troops, Japanese, who had quit their arms and who appeared incapable of any offensive or self-protecting gesture. <laughs> wow. All those war crimes, and the Japanese still didn't get used to killing. It seems like Grossman's theory about conditioning soldiers doesn't seem to have panned out too well. But he still never stops to think that there might be other factors at play. Grossman even notes that during the 1968 My Lai Massacre, the lieutenant had to explicitly order his men to kill, attempting to use this as evidence that they were resistant to killing. Because Grossman lives in a world where refusing to fire even when your life depends on it and slaughtering hundreds of defenseless women and children because someone said pretty please are both confirmations of his theory. Grossman's entire thesis that humans are inherently resistant to killing is based on cherry picking from within sources that he cherry picked and is fueled by his purposeful misunderstanding of history. His proposed solution of conditioning soldiers to accept killing is based on the flawed unsupported assumption that that was even the problem in the first place. Other variables such as fear, equipment, skill level, confusion, morale, and a lack of experience simply do a better job of explaining historical firing rates than a supposed midbrain resistance. Even Grossman's alleged differences in firing rates between World War II and Vietnam can be explained by the fact that there was a much higher percentage of volunteers in Vietnam. And Grossman's observation that the post-Vietnam firing rate continued to go up is easily explained by the fact that we stopped drafting people altogether. And yet, Grossman would rather misrepresent sources and arguments than admit that his hypothesis might not be the best explanation that we have. And I'm not going to pretend that a moral resistance to killing has never played a part in human conflict, but Grossman's wide sweeping theories overinflate its importance to the point where he's practically trampling over the work of actual historians. Because for Grossman's work to be relevant, a moral resistance to killing can't simply be one small factor in a sea of other variables. It has to be the dominant variable, the single factor on which wars are won and lost. And this myopic view of history has led him to engage in a mangling of past events so blatant his book could likely be debunked point by point. But what would it mean if Grossman were right? What if the vast majority of people are incapable of killing, and that violent conditioning against human targets does make you more likely to accept killing actual humans? If we accept this thesis, it quickly leads us to a weird, inevitable conclusion that Grossman fully embraces. Video games cause violence. That's right, killing virtual people in games makes you more likely to kill them in real life. It's an essential conclusion of Grossman's thesis, and he's written a whole book about it as recently as 2016. And it makes sense that he would harp on this issue, because if video games don't cause violence, then that threatens the validity of his whole worldview. So let's check. Attributing violence to video gaming is not scientifically sound. The idea that video games drive real-world violence has been extensively studied for decades. Researchers have studied tens of thousands of participants over many years, and there is simply insufficient evidence to conclude that video games have any meaningful effect on real-world violence. Now, if you ask Grossman about this topic, he'll probably show you a page that looks like this, because this is a photocopy from one of his training courses. Unfortunately, despite finding two higher quality images, I can't find the original study anywhere. So I can only address general findings in this type of research. A lot of studies finding a link between video games and violence either fail to look at causality or don't look at long-term impacts. The studies that do look at long-term causal relationships sometimes find a link to aggression, but they largely don't find a link to crime or violence. While you can say that video games might cause a small increase in aggressive behavior, you can't say that they drive crime. And if you're still concerned about aggression, you know what else you should ban? Sports! 
which also reward aggressive and competitive behavior in a zero-sum context. But I don't see Dave Grossman cherry-picking research to ban sports. But Grossman will go on about school shootings, classical conditioning, and anything else he can to convince you that violent media is turning your kids into monsters, and how school shooters overwhelmingly don't play sports, but they do play video games. At times he would refuse to go to school or even bathe due to his obsession with video games. His mother this says she would confiscate her son's gaming equipment after finding him playing uh, overnight. Gone. She says when she put his gaming controllers in her bedroom behind a locked really door, shaping punched a young hole. people's thoughts. But in the video game, you blow your playmates' heads off in explosions of blood. Does the play stop? You get in trouble, you get points. You're rewarded for inflicting death and suffering. First of all, school shooters don't play a disproportionate amount of video games. Second of all, Grossman is ignoring the obvious lurking variables of mental illness and social isolation that would point towards video games as a symptom, not the disease. It's not that video games create school shooters and sports don't, it's that the kind of apathetic loners that commit school shootings are also friendless antisocial weirdos that aren't exactly drawn towards team activities. But what Grossman will rarely do is show any data on actual violence, because the rise of video games as a medium is correlated with a historic decrease in youth violence. Oh, you don't like that source? Okay, here's another one. And here is youth violence going down all the way to 2020. So violent media causing youth violence isn't exactly a pressing societal concern. In fact, some people have proposed that video games are actually responsible for lowering the crime rate by keeping the young men most likely to commit crimes inside and off the streets. In fact, if we go back to this graph, you can see the exact moment that Sony released the massively popular PlayStation. Now, that exact timing might be a coincidence, but I still think it's neat. Unfortunately, Grossman can't accept the widespread scientific consensus that violent media has either a non-existent or negative impact on crime, because it would mean that his entire thesis on the psychology of violence has to be reevaluated. I'm reminded of this tweet, because if this doesn't describe Dave Grossman, then I don't know what does. Unfortunately for Grossman, the first edition of On Killing came out in the mid-90s, so he was unaware that crime would continue dropping for the next few decades. But instead of admitting that his theories were obviously wrong, he came up with an alternative theory as to why violent crime appeared to be dropping. He posits that Western countries are actually experiencing a secret, invisible rise in murder rates. You just can't tell because continuously advancing medical technology is saving the lives of people that, back in the day, would have ended up as a murder statistic. In fact, he claims that the current murder rate is at least four or five times higher than currently reported. And that's a pretty interesting hypothesis. Unfortunately for Grossman, it's also not true. If you look at a 20-year snippet of the murder rate, you can see that it's obviously declining. However, if you look at the murder rate per violent crime, which is in green, you can see that it has stayed almost perfectly constant, because the rate of violent crimes has also been declining. If a secretly enormous murder rate were being suppressed by advances in medical technology, we would expect to see a decline in the amount of murder per violent crime, which means the green line would be going down. Would-be murder victims saved by advanced medicine would still count as assault or battery victims, and the overall violent crime numbers would be unchanged. And if there were an epidemic of attempted murders, we would expect to see a rise, or at least a plateau, in overall violent crime. For certain times in our history, that was arguably the case. The one singular 21-year-old study that Grossman is able to cite found that between 1931 and 1998, there was a 700% rise in aggravated assaults, but a 25% drop in murder. And that sounds alarming until you ask yourself, what are the odds of an assault being reported to the police in 1931? This was the middle of the Great Depression. The mob had de facto control over many urban centers, the 911 system hadn't been invented yet, and domestic violence wouldn't be a common legal term for over 40 years. What percentage of the shakedowns, fistfights, and wife beatings do you honestly think were being reported? And could the advances over the next 67 years have had an effect on those numbers? Even the original paper notes that the drop in criminal lethality could even be explained by
by something as simple as an increase in population density. With higher density comes a higher likelihood that an attack will be witnessed and the victim will get prompt medical attention. However, that same factor of population density could increase the amount of assaults reported. With increased witnesses and better public services comes a higher likelihood that any random fist fight becomes an assault statistic. Now, the authors also observed that the decline in the ratio of homicides to assaults almost perfectly matches the decline in the ratio of motor vehicle deaths to motor vehicle crashes. The authors hypothesized that advances in trauma medicine could explain both findings. However, what they don't address is that the time period in question also coincides with the widespread adoption of crumpled zones, seatbelt legislation, airbags, anti-lock brakes, head restraints, and child safety seat. Cars were getting safer for reasons other than improved trauma medicine, which means the matching rates between motor vehicle deaths and homicides shouldn't be a confirmation for researchers, it should be a red flag. Now, are these all the problems with the paper? No. These are only the most obvious problems on page 16 specifically. I didn't want to make this section too long, and I like to challenge myself. What the authors of the paper really found was a reflection of the massive way in which society changed throughout the 20th century. When we look at the trends of recent decades, where the laws, systems, population density, and political power structures are more similar to the modern day, we see an almost continuous drop in all sorts of violent crime. Here's another graph that shows the decline over a 30-year period. And when you compare the two graphs, you can see that the violent crime and murder rates are falling together, which makes a lot of sense. Medical advances can't exactly stop armed robbery from taking place. So Grossman's claim that murder rates are actually several times higher is almost certainly wrong. The idea that crime rates have been rising instead of falling is a myth fueled by the tendency of media companies to sensationalize stories using fear-mongering. This is a well-studied phenomenon, and here's another graph showing how many people believe this false narrative. Ironically, Grossman talks about the secretly rising murder rates in a video about media myths and propaganda. Propaganda that he himself is propagating! Now, Grossman's data is questionable at best, but the real problem here is not the 2002 study that he cites. All research is going to have some variables confounding the results. The authors fully admit their methodological problems in the study and do their best to adjust for them. That's a completely normal way for research to function, and broad conclusions relating to public policy should not be drawn without much more extensive research. The problem is that Grossman is very much drawing broad conclusions on public policy. He uses the idea that there is a secretly rising murder rate to argue that law enforcement is effectively at war against a rising tide of violence, and that the only proper response to this wave of violence is to condition officers to kill more effectively and as an automatic response. They're coming to your mall, they're coming to your theater, they're coming to your church, they're coming to your kid's school, and you need to be ready for them. Grossman is using a single, faulty data point as a fear-mongering tactic to increase state-sponsored violence. And who provides training and seminars to law enforcement on how to become more effective killers? <laughs> Why, Dave Grossman, of course, for just a small $6,000 minimum fee plus travel and expenses. Wow, Grossman has diagnosed the problem and he sells the cure? What a crazy coincidence! Needless to say, teaching law enforcement to kill as an automatic response is something of a controversial stance. In his book, Train to Kill, Grossman praises the supposed strides law enforcement has made by noting, The military and law enforcement community have made killing a conditioned response. Tom Aveni, former cop, forensic psychologist, and training coordinator at Smith & Wesson Academy, took issue with Grossman's statement, pointing out that it should be viewed as less of a compliment and as more of an accusation. Your allegations imply that deadly force is routinely employed in a manner that is the product of a conditioned response. The troubling implication is that police don't use professional judgment on a case-by-case -case basis. They merely pull triggers as a matter of conditioning. This is why I said that Grossman is so uniquely responsible for our modern issues with police violence. He has made a multi-decade career out of teaching law enforcement to kill without thinking. His sensationalist claims have captured public imagination and allowed his emotionally appealing myths to spread far deeper and far wider than we ever should have allowed. His primary thesis, combined with his incessant fear-mongering, has created a set of conditions that has resulted in needless death and a lack of public trust in our law enforcement.
Hand in hand with his work with law enforcement is Grossman's analogy of the sheepdog. You see, Grossman posits there are three kinds of people, which is already a red flag for anyone trained in psychology. There are sheep, sheepdogs, and wolves. The sheep Actually, I'm just gonna let Grossman explain this one. An old retired colonel put it to me like this. He said, Dave, most of the people in our society are sheep. They're kind, decent, gentle, productive creatures who can only hurt each other by accident under extreme provocation. Then they're wolves. And the wolves will feed on the sheep without mercy. And then the old boy said, there are sheepdogs. He said, I am a sheepdog. I am a predator too. But I live to protect the lambs and confront the wolf. First of all, this is about as scientific as horoscopes or Harry Potter houses, while somehow being even more cringe-inducing. It's not a scientific theory. It's just a feel-good story that attempts to make all soldiers, police officers, and armed men in a middle-aged crisis feel like uniquely qualified protectors of civilization who aren't subject to sheep society's rules or morality. The harmless, stupid sheep do nothing but live in denial about the wolves and their myths, and it's up to the small number of sheepdogs to hunt and exterminate the wolves by any means necessary. Wow, I'm sure that creating a rigid us-versus-them mentality in a way that dehumanizes people and preemptively deflects all criticism as sheep living in denial couldn't possibly backfire, especially when you also make killing an automatic conditioned response. No way could this ever lead to unnecessary violence. Oh, but we're not done. Next, we add in the idea that the sheepdogs are actually chosen by God to protect his flock, and that they can ignore society's rules because of their holy mission to wage war against the wolves. Now, what is a wolf? Grossman never specifies. Murderers, rapists, robbers, pickpockets, litterbugs, annoying neighbors, minorities? Who knows? When Grossman tells us wolves are genetically primed for violence, what exactly does that mean? Is a 12-year-old who starts a fight a wolf? If they started a fight, they're certainly not a sheep or a sheepdog. Instead, they must be a wolf pup that's genetically primed for violence and has to be put down before they develop a taste for sheep flesh. But if a decorated police officer beats their wife, are they a sheepdog or a wolf? If someone that's never heard a fly tackles a mass shooter, are they a sheep or a sheepdog? Because if human beings are actually complex creatures capable of being simultaneously noble and cruel, then the whole analogy kind of breaks down, doesn't it? But if a sheepdog, chosen by God himself, says someone is a wolf, who are you to argue with them? Maybe you're actually a wolf in disguise. And maybe you should stop questioning your brave sheepdog protectors, because who else can protect you from the wolves in this world? I mean, just think about how a sheepdog could have stopped 9-11. Which is a point that Grossman unironically makes. When the sheep heard about the 9-11 hijackings, they said, thank God I wasn't on that plane. When the sheepdog heard about the 9-11 hijackings, they said, I wish I was on that plane. Wonder what a sheepdog would have done? Well, wonder no more. Daniel Lewin was a 31-year-old member of Israel's Prime Special Forces Unit. He was seated near the hijackers on Flight 11, and it's believed that he attempted to stop them. He died immediately. Most of the plane wasn't even aware that a fight had taken place. And he was a young elite soldier. So if he can't pull it off, I doubt any other lone sheepdog would have made much of a difference. But what would Dave Grossman have done? Fist fight several armed, motivated men simultaneously? Illegally sneak a loaded firearm onto a plane? Violate all known practices and procedures at the time and several laws in order to fire bullets on a pressurized aircraft? Not only are these ideas insane, they're also revisionist history. Back in the day, airplane hijackings used to be much more common, but they weren't terrorist attacks. Instead, they were often done to force the plane to a new location, to hold hostages for ransom, to extract political concessions, or any number of other reasons. And just like muggings today, the conventional wisdom at the time was to simply comply. Give the hijackers what they want, and if the plane has to be taken back by force, authorities will handle that once they get the plane to land. 9-11 was not like the hijackings that preceded it and it dramatically changed our views on how catastrophic hijackings could be. None of the passengers aboard Flight 11 could have known what was going to happen. All they knew was that they were supposed to comply with hijackers and let the authorities handle it. If Grossman had attempted to engage the hijackers in a life or death struggle, he would have been going against conventional wisdom and official policy. It's only in hindsight 
that we know that resistance was a good idea. The reason that Flight 93, on which passengers did take the plane back from the hijackers, was different is because that hijacking started much later. Shortly after it began, passengers were able to use their phones to learn about the other planes, which is when they realized that the normal rules no longer applied, and that they had to act. Ironically, the main heroes of Flight 93 were, by all accounts, normal sheep. 9-11 is a great example of why Grossman is wrong. Not only did the lone sheepdog fail to protect anyone, but the sheep were also able to band together to thwart the wolves. And that's because evil isn't defeated by heroes standing alone. It's defeated by communities coming together. Die Hard is fictional, and Hollywood lied to you. But Grossman attempts to twist the narrative in his favor by stating that the passengers transformed from sheep to sheepdogs before taking back the plane. Miraculously, he manages to ignore the fact that random people being able to move from one category to another in the span of minutes completely undermines his entire theory. However, if you still think of yourself as a sheepdog that could have totally stopped the terrorists, please remember that the other guys on 9-11 thought they were anointed by God to fight evil with righteous violence too. And that's because the kind of logic that Grossman employs has rarely been used to justify good things throughout history. Both sheepdogs and wolves believe that sheep are beneath them, that they aren't subject to sheep society's rules, and that they can kill without remorse because only their violence is okay. Which group you think is which simply depends on which kind of violence you believe is righteous, and that's going to mainly come down to your cultural bias. And no, I'm not saying that terrorists are morally equivalent to law enforcement, but that's because I also have a cultural bias. Whether you believe a group like police officers are sheepdogs or wolves likely depends on whether you think police are a thin blue line protecting us from anarchy or a fundamentally racist institution to keep the lower classes in check. Really, Grossman's logic could be used to dehumanize essentially anyone as long as you come at it with the right cultural perspective. If I explained Grossman's theory to all of the genocidal regimes throughout history, every single one of them would say that they're the sheepdogs. However, Grossman's use of overt Christian imagery, revisionist history, fear-mongering over violent media, and righteous violence makes it obvious that his idea of a sheepdog is actually an armed Christian nationalist ready to start a bloody holy war. And we have special power. We have supernatural power. The Lord God Almighty, the creator of the universe, will empower you. You're the warriors, the paladins imbued with the power of the Holy Spirit. And if that doesn't describe you, then you're apparently either a sheep or a wolf, meaning you can either lick Grossman's boot or get crushed by it. Remember that Grossman built his career off of making killing easy and automatic, not fair or just. The purpose of the sheepdog analogy is to dehumanize any enemy as a wolf, thus making them easier to kill. But the introduction of these kinds of hard categories in the civilian and law enforcement worlds serve to do nothing but demonize people who do not at all deserve to die. Even in the military sphere, where the enemy labels themselves with uniforms, this is still the kind of absolutist thinking that leads to war crimes. Strangely, Grossman seems fully aware of the power of stories, and how dehumanization can lead to atrocities. But he contends that officers can easily rein in this behavior because soldiers are trained to follow orders. Except even he says that officer orders caused the My Lai Massacre, probably because officers are indoctrinated with the same dehumanizing stories and myths in a perfect example of the blind leading the blind. It's obvious to anyone with a brain that almost no one fits perfectly into any of these categories. And even Grossman acknowledges that the categories exist on a spectrum. But if these genetically determined categories also exist on a spectrum that anyone can zip across in an instant, then this isn't really a theory at all, is it? Grossman hasn't actually given us a theory of human nature. He's given us a problematic mental shortcut whose only purpose is self-aggrandizement and the dehumanization of a nebulous other. It's just a cool sounding story that sells seminars to stressed out police officers who don't want to have to feel bad about shooting unarmed people. Grossman's goal isn't to make state-sponsored killing moral or just. His goal is to make it easier and to remove 
any hesitancy an officer might have to kill, whether that be doubts about necessity, moral qualms, or even societal accountability. The only thing that matters to Grossman is that state actors feel good about killing automatically and without second thought. And just in case you think that Grossman might be willing to accept literally any level of societal accountability for the righteous violence that he likes talking about, let me read you a quote from one of his books. Sometimes the sheep are frightened by the sheepdogs. This is because the sheepdogs look a little bit like the wolves, with their fur, sharp fangs, and watchful eyes. It reminds the sheep that the wolves could be nearby, ready to harm them. They worry about the sheepdog, and they're not sure they want him around. But when do they change their minds? When the wolf comes. Then the whole flock tries to hide behind the closest sheepdog. And yes, this is a children's picture book. If you're concerned about the media brainwashing your kids, how about teaching them the necessity of unchecked authoritarian violence? The way Grossman frames his analogy intentionally emphasizes that society being afraid of its protectors is normal, and that any attempt to keep the sheepdogs in check exclusively comes from a place of denial, ignorance, and cowardice. It's propaganda that attempts to ensure that figures in the military and law enforcement are never held to any level of accountability. Despite civilian control of the military being one of the bedrock principles on which our armed forces are built, and the fact that a lieutenant colonel should know that. In truth, Grossman's analogy is nothing more than a rhetorical sleight of hand, used to justify whatever acts of violence Grossman happens to agree with. It's not based on even a pretense of actual psychology or human nature, and is instead a dehumanizing, unscientific call to holy violence. But maybe you know that you're different from the people around you. Maybe you don't fit into the mold that all of sheep society expects you to fill. And the sheep's endless denial of the darkness in the world is something that you can never understand. But your inability to understand society does not mean you've been ordained by God to enact holy violence. It means you're autistic. Now, throughout all of this research, the main thing that confused me about Dave Grossman is how a former professor in psychology could possibly make such basic mistakes, from failing to check data, to misapplying research, to peddling absurd theories about there being three kinds of people. None of it seemed like something a trained psychologist would ever do. Even I know better than that, and I majored in political science. And all of this made a lot more sense when I learned that he doesn't have a PhD in psychology, and instead holds a master's in counseling psychology, which is a degree usually held by teachers or marriage counselors, not clinical psychologists. The closest he got to clinical experience was a middle school counselor internship. The reason he became a professor is because West Point doesn't actually require professors to have a PhD or even any qualifications in their chosen subject, so long as they're a military officer. And no, that's not a normal way for higher education to work. I don't want to say that anyone needs a piece of paper in order to do research, but it's also clear that Grossman has never done any research and isn't even qualified to attempt any. He's incapable of separating good data from bad and he seems to draw broad conclusions based on stunningly little evidence. And not only does his counseling background explain his unfamiliarity with data, it also helps explain why he so readily ignores any other explanations for his observations. Because the other explanations often don't focus on the kinds of things counselors are trained to look for. Unfortunately, Grossman has stepped far outside the bounds of his training by attempting to counsel not only people, but public policy and political institutions. He's a man that is determined to make government actors completely comfortable with their control over life and death, in a manner that puts the internal comfort of the sheepdog over the needs of society and even individual lives. Grossman is seemingly concerned with handling the perceived trauma of his patient and nothing else. The resulting implications of his work have been catastrophic and done incalculable damage to the political legitimacy of law enforcement, which I only lightly touched on here because I plan to cover it in a future video. Ultimately, Grossman is a man that has done little more than peddle pseudoscience for the past 30 years. The massive influence he's had on police and societal culture has done nothing but harm to our society. And that is why he holds the number one spot on my list of people who can meet me in the Denny's parking lot. The number two spot is held by John Mearsheimer, and don't worry, I'll get to him.
Thank you for watching. Sources are in the description and make sure to fill out your bingo cards before venturing into the comments. I know I've got mine because I have a feeling we're going to see some doozies. Also, writing a 17 page research script is really hard, so please subscribe. Also follow me on Twitter. But most importantly, don't refer to yourself as a sheepdog.